Hi. <laughs> okay, are we on? Can you hear us? Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> hello. <laughs> this is for uh, the 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 microphone is for the uh, the mixer. So anyway, hi. Hi. Am I tuned in? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, today, hello, I am Melissa Hill. I'm You're, Neil Preston. <laughs> welcome to Melissa Hill Raw Talk. Oops, I forgot. I have to open up the window so I can see the chat. Um, okay, hold I on. I can face the Okay, here we go. The girl on chat. We got, hello. We have some people here. Hi. Come out, come out wherever you are. I'm here. Um, okay, doing the live chat. Okay, so you are listening to Melissa Hill Raw Talk. My name is Melissa Hill. This is Raw Talk. I am joined by my special guest co-host, Neil Preston. Hello. And today is March 5th, 2019. Um, as you can see, I'm, okay, I'm trying to, there we go. Got a bunch of new equipment here. Yes, got a bunch of new equipment, <laughs> That, to say the least. Okay. Um, today I will be doing the chat from, 
this screen right here that's in my hands. Um, let's get rid of that guy. Okay, come on. All right. Oh. There we are. Okay. So, oops, let me make sure the volume is down. Okay. All right, then. There we are. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a little, little, little weird. Let's move the window over a little bit so that we can expand this. Um, There's a little delay between that and that, which is cool. right. Yeah. So we don't. We're not going to look at this to yeah. monitor the um, the picture. The picture. Yeah. This is just. Or you can move it all the way over. There we are. That way. Right. So we are also today. We we are also broadcasting live on through Mixler, um, which is a radio app. I hope people are able to listen and hear well. <laughs> um, we are also going to be do, opening up phone lines later on. And the call-in number is 619-202-1163. 619-202-1163. We'll be opening up the phone lines uh, around uh, at the top of the hour. So depending on wherever you're, you're uh Listening whatever from, hour you're at. Yeah, whichever hour you're at. Um, okay, let's see. And also, if you're using the Mixler app, you are able to do a chat through through that as well. So if you have questions. Okay. So why am I hearing myself? Oh. It's, it's through those speakers. Through what speakers? Through the bookshelf speakers. Okay, because it's my phone. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So um, if you're using the Mixler app, you are able to uh, join in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and type a message, hello, on the Mixler app, just in case any of you are listening through Mixler. Um, okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We got the chat here. Okay. So we got Carl. We have Nick and... John and uh, and pitch pitchfork seventeen. Pitchfork seventeen. Yes, uh, my hair looks a little funny right now because I have uh, these um, headphones. No, on. I know it's good. The white headphones. You, you got the mob shirt happening. Right. Um, okay. So, <laughs> and we're adjusting now. There we go. Now. Earlier this evening, um, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, as things happen, as you know, unexpected things happen in a live yes, live radio, live live stream, live, live radio, life. live life. And I had spoken on the phone earlier this evening um, or earlier this afternoon to Van Ling, the director of Cliffs of Freedom, who was scheduled to be our guest. And I also spoke with the producer, Casey Cannon. Um, you know, she called in to to. She was really looking forward to the show happening tonight. But um, those of you who may or may not be familiar with the film, uh, it opened up in limited release uh, just in New York and L.A. Oh. And as of yesterday, they expanded the release. So now it's playing in more theaters. Uh, so there's a screening tomorrow night, and there was a problem with the film uh, at the lab that is processing the film for tomorrow's screening. So because the producer Casey was is ill, uh, Van had to go down personally to the lab and take care of the, oversee the, right. the situation. Um, and- He is the director. Right, so. and Van Ling is the director of Cliffs of Freedom, uh, as well as many other things that he's, you know, he's had a pretty prolific career already. Um, so he's going to call in. So that's why I decided to open up the phone lines. He's going to be calling in around 7.45. Uh, this is going to be another new little test thing. Right, <laughs> it seems exactly. like every week there's like a new, I don't know, I guess now we're at beta test 17, uh, number seven. <laughs> <laughs> beta test number seven. Uh, so I'm really going to, you know, I, I want you guys to continue with the chat because uh, now that I'm no longer on that other station, I've come to uh, really appreciate the chat. Um, and okay, good. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we got we got Joe. So I'm noticing there's a bit of a delay on my on my tablet on your monitor. Yeah, yeah. that than there is on oh. the monitor there. So let's tr we'll try not to look at. We're gonna try and <laughs> we'll not, try not to look at ourselves. Yeah, we're gonna try and not look at the chat over here oh. so that. We're just looking at ourselves. <laughs> or do we even need to do that? 
Well, it's good to see how, how it looks. Like right now I can see my hair looks really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> I can't see that over there. Um, okay. Yeah, all right. There you go. Thank you. So a lot of devices here. Oh, good. We got Eric. Eric. So I, Eric, one of our moderators said he wasn't feeling well. wasn't sure if he's going to be able to make it. Raw talk mode motto. Learn, learn it on the fly. That's right. That yeah, no doubt right there. Um, okay, so fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Um, I don't know why it's saying okay, live chat. Um, top chat. All right. So I want to say thank you to my sponsor. <laughs> Um, because now my sponsor wasn't, uh, doesn't have to pay the weekly fee for that other station. We're now able to upgrade the equipment. So I like yes. to say thank you to my sponsor you're, for helping me upgrade some equipment. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. We have, we have a new microphone. Look at that. Look at that. That is pretty professional looking blue, a blue mic. We have Sterling. What is this thing called? This box. I don't know. It's like a mixer box. A mixer box. Something. So that uh, in preparation for tonight's show, thinking I was going to have three people here, uh, we got this little control box now. I'm not going to hold it up because it's, I don't want to mess anything up. <laughs> then we'd really go off the rails. Right. So. And we also have a new web camera. So if those of you who are watching through YouTube are kind of going, why is the picture a lot more clearer now? Why can I see that our hair is so fucked cool. up? <laughs> 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 so we have a new Logitech uh, HP 1080p. A webcam. webcam. Yep. So thank you, sponsor. You're welcome. <laughs> um, again, like I said, I'm still going to be launching a Patreon because uh, th all the stuff, even though the equipment is paid for, there's still like monthly subscription costs for the radio app um, and Vimeo uh, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, all sorts of other kind of things like that. So, oh, we got a hello, Neil. Joe says hello. Hello. And um, Carl says hello. Hello. And anyway, so in preparation for, for tonight for the call-in guest Van, uh, let's talk a little bit about who he is or how you, how okay. Neil, uh, you were involved, involved with, in, with in the project. Okay. Um, I had known or have known Casey Cannon, who's the producer on this movie. Uh, I've known her for... 18 years, uh, she was, I believe, the head of the special effects department when we did Vanilla Sky, which came out in 2001, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and Casey has moved up to producer. And I, I believe that Van, uh, uh, his background is all, also in special effects. And he is the director of the movie. So uh, I had been called by Casey see about me working a couple of days uh, on some additional shooting that they had uh, planned and that didn't pan out. But then uh, we kept talking and we decided to uh, try to produce a coffee table book based on the movie to more or less coincide with the release of the movie. I think we might have Van Ling on the phone as we speak. Uh, yep, that is. So I'm going to say hello. Hey, Neil. Yeah, hey, Van. Hey, hey there. How, how are you doing? Oh, we're just trying to figure out what, where to hold this phone. Where do you want me to hold it? We're just going to put it next to the microphone. So, Van, you're live on the air right now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, where's the microphone on here? Uh, the speaker, you mean? A uh, speaker. The speaker, okay. it's on the bottom. Okay. So just bear with us, Van. You know, we're technologically <laughs> challenged here, but we're, we're getting there. Right. So, no uh, we're, so uh, we were just talking about you. Uh -oh. And um, yeah, and um, and I had mentioned that uh, I had known Casey for a long time, and she introduced me to you, and we've been trying to put a book together. And right. uh, and um, congratulations on the on the movie again. I know I've told you before, but it really is fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, I apologize for not being able to be there in person. As you well know, Casey, as my producer and boss, uh, sends me wherever I need to go. So, <laughs> exactly. and I have to, and I had to go put out some fires. So, okay. Well, um, everything all right down there? Yeah, yeah. Just you know, trying to trying to get things uh, get things done, and and uh, you know, deal with all those little things that can be fixed, but they just need to be, yeah. you know managed yeah so. yeah they you know it just goes to show everyone out there that when you shoot a movie 
uh, when you finish shooting, the job, if you're working on the crew, is not finished by a long shot, especially if you're the producer or director. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's so much. A lot of people don't appreciate how much goes into making a movie. And, you know, Casey, Casey says this now, that, uh, you know, any movie that actually gets finished is a miracle. <laughs> you know, and any film that gets finished and then released is a double miracle. Right. Because there's just so much that has to be done and so many collaborating. I mean, you you saw our credits. There's like a thousand yeah. plus people. Yeah, there, yeah, there are, there are a lot of people on that on that credit roll. Um, yeah. How big was your crew basically every day? Like uh, you're, on, a, you're, on you're, a daily basis, yeah, yeah. probably somewhere between fifty and uh, you know, I'd say fifty or sixty. And then on uh, on the big work days where we right. had like battle scenes and stuff, right. We would have we would have upwards of 100, 150. Oh my god! You know, because you have extras, you have all these people dressed up as, as uh, you know, right. Greeks and Turks, right. and and you got to make sure everyone gives their swords back at the end of the day. They should have been <laughs> front of the camera, behind the camera, right? Stuff like that. Um, well, the, the movie is is you know I liken it to a, a kind of a Doctor Zhivago. Uh, yeah, in, in that its was scope, very, in that its was, scope. That, yeah, that was very much our uh, our intent was to try to, you know, make it a make it kind of a throwback to you know Braveheart and and Doctor Shivago and even Lawrence of Arabia. Not that we yeah. you know we're ever going to hit those kind of heights and, and that kind of importance, but what we, you know, what we really felt was there's actually this classic kind of Hollywood storytelling that isn't really done that much anymore. Right. Um, and we wanted to go for that feel for both for kind of historical reasons, just to kind of make it feel, you know, because it's, it is a, it is a Hollywood kind of epic. It's not a, you know, kind of a independent, you know, film that's, right. that's done in the language. And, yeah, and, and it, it is a period piece, obviously. Yeah. And, the other main reason, too, is because one thing I found through the process of my research on the film and working with our Greek financiers and the Greeks that you know worked on the show with us, they are a very proud and passionate mm -hmm. people. And that passion is very dramatic. And so um, this felt like the right tone and style right. to take with the film to kind of capture that level of passion that the Greek, the Greek culture has. So it was a, it was really a, an interesting challenge. Yeah, and and this yeah. was the first uh, feature that you've directed. Yes, yeah, it's the first. It's the first full feature. I've I've you know done little things here and there, but nothing. Ooh, wait, on little this scale. things, little what, things. What, wait a second. What, 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 <laughs> some of those little things might be. Uh, I mean. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, did, weren't you involved in Terminator Two? Uh, yeah. Now that that wasn't a little thing. <laughs> yeah, but I but I'm saying as a director. As a, oh, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, and and yeah, that I mean, that was a huge thing, and it was an amazing educational experience for me because I was on the ground floor, not only of working with uh, you know a, a filmmaker who is an incredible visionary, you know, not only in terms of storytelling and in terms of telling, you know, you know great drama, great action, great characters, but also technologically. He's the kind of director who knows what he wants to show, may not know how to do it, mm -hmm. but then helps figure out ways to do it technologically, in this particular case, you know, using right. computer graphics and so on, that right. then changes the game for everyone else. Right. You know, and, and that's and also yeah. you have to stay in budget or under budget. Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know, it, it's so it it was it was amazing and uh, and an honor and an opportunity to have gained experience working on shows like that and The Abyss and um, you know Titanic. Oh my that god! Was, so I've oh. I've worked on a I've worked on a few shows. Right. <laughs> just and, just a you know, few. Yeah. So you bring yeah. you bring all that experience and knowledge into your first directorial. Um, yeah, so. I mean that's that's you know what everybody you know should be doing right take their experience learn you know how things work get to see on set right. how things work how things don't work how to get a particular result how to find you know ways to deal with things i mean just little even little things yeah. like when you're shooting for instance when you're trying to shoot grease in that in for scenes that take place in uh, in the warmth of autumn 
Right. Uh, but you're shooting them in the dead of winter uh, <laughs> in New Mexico. Oh. And you have, um, and you have, you know, you're shooting because of the schedule. Um, you're having to shoot a day scene at night, right. which means you're lighting the whole area or the, the, the set area to make it look like it's daytime right. when in fact it's night. And because it's night and it's winter and you're seeing your yeah. actor's your, breath, your breath. Yeah. coming out because it's freaking cold. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, it, but, but it's a daytime scene. There's not supposed to be any breath because they're in autumn. It should be, you know, 70s right. or 80 degrees. And well, what, what do you do about that? Well, there's two things you do. One, you digitally remove oh the breath after you shoot it in visual effects. That's one wow. way to do it. We, we had to do some of that. Or you try to minimize the amount of breath that you see by getting your actors to suck on ice cubes before their takes. Wow. I never wow. heard that. That's because a great trick. Because what that'll do is it, it'll cool your mouth down. Right. So your so breath already is colder, right. is colder in your mouth so that when you breathe it out, it's now closer to the temperature of the air outside. That is and fantastic. And therefore you don't see the breath. I've so never those, heard that trick. And I learned that on the abyss. So you, wow. you find you find a lot of really interesting uh, things you pick up along the way and you, you apply them. And, where where well, necessary. So I'm so I'm curious. Well, now that just brought up two questions. One, I have one question: is what made you decide to have this film? And I know this is the typical question that you've been asked already. What made you decide to have this film be your directorial debut? But going back to the ice cube on the breath thing, like when the moment happened when you realized you're going to need that, like did you did you already know ahead of time that this was a trick that you're going to possibly need, or did you go back into your memory banks and your file of facts in your head and, and start going, Oh, wait a second. I learned this trick. Right. I learned this trick on Titanic. We can do ice yeah. cubes on the breath. Yeah. I mean, it's a combination. You store away a lot of really little things. And, and the funny thing about movie making is that every movie that is made is a new experience. Even though, even if you're doing the same genre that other people right. have done, it was a car chase movie, an action movie, a drama a romance. There are things that, you learn to do when you're making any movie and they are one-offs. It's like taking a custom job, you know, and like, let's say you, let's say you work, you, you're on Etsy and you make pillows and there's a particular design thing and you use these techniques, but it's only for that design. And right. you think, okay, you're never going to use it again. You know, when we make movies, you know, usually what happens is you, you make a movie, you have to learn how to do each of these things. When we shot the abyss, created the first underwater sound stage essentially wow. in a unused nuclear reactor containment vessel in south carolina which meant we had a seven and a half million gallon tank that was 60 feet deep oh my god um well, wow. I, 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 we had to figure out lighting we had to yeah. figure out all this underwater lighting underwater sound equipment we created all this stuff and when you're done with that movie it's like okay we're never going to make a movie like this again. So <laughs> you've learned all these skills that you, all you can do is file them away. Right. So you got hired for but, return to the yeah, abyss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> until, yeah until you do this, until you do the sequel. So what happens is you have all of these kind of random tricks in your head. And then luckily if you run into a situation where you go, well, I remember on this show, we did this, we could adapt that to what's going on here. And yeah. then that's kind of how those ideas pop into your head. They're they're kind of stored in deep memory, right? Right. And right. and you know it wasn't. I, I I didn't go out. You know I should have. You see, if I was a good planner, if I was a better planner, I would have had a whole list of okay. Here's all the things we're going to run into. Part of the job of a director and a producer yeah. on the show, and Casey can tell you this, uh, is that you have to anticipate every possible thing that could possibly go wrong, right. that could possibly happen on a, on any given scene, any given project, uh, any given part of the process. Because right. it will not, happen. Yeah. yeah. Not only, well, something will happen. And yeah. the idea is you can't think of everything. But what you can do is think of everything you possibly can. So those you can fix on autopilot and address the things that you didn't anticipate. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, uh, so that's a, so that's a, you know, a big part of the process. It's, it's problem solving. It's a lot of times it's creative problem solving. Right. Because what you plan doesn't always work the way you want it to happen because the actor was sick that day or yeah. the crane didn't show up or you ask for a, a, a 
a uh, you know a, a certain type of animal, and you get a completely different kind of animal that <laughs> <laughs> that happens to fall in the species. But that's about it. You know, so it has it's, a tail. It's yeah. It has a tail. Uh, actually, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you when you're shooting, uh, do you play music in between takes to to like set a mood for the actors or the scene? Not in this particular instance because it's a period piece and they're method um, actors. <laughs> yeah, and and it's you know it, every actor has a different method, and right. they have some of them do that. They they kind of yeah. use music in the mood, but it's hard to to use. First of all, it's hard to use modern music which is what people mm. more connect with right. to, uh, to use on a, to use on the set uh, or, or even an actor to be, you know, they're, you know, they're going to be listening to Tom Petty and, <laughs> and then going and doing a period, you know, scene. It's, it's hard. It's hard because what happens is you, you get into that music right. and part of the music is timeless, but part of it is very much in the period in which it was created. Right. And, most people hook into that. You know, yeah. we love music from the eighties because it reminds us at a certain age of when we were, you know, young and free and living in that yeah. age. And you, so you mean you the sixties <laughs> oh, or you know, again, for everybody it's different. Yeah. And when that happens, that means you'll pick up some of those mannerisms right. and, and those, and those attitudes. And that may not be right. So, if you're doing, <laughs> so, so, take, so, so taking that idea, did you use mm -hmm. period music or Greek music or Turkish music for uh, Cliffs of Freedom? We did have some, uh, we did create um, some Turkish music and some Greek music. Uh -huh. um, we used those for playback during certain scenes, uh, like for the dancing harem girls right. or, or the dancing in the, in the Greek festival. But in general, you don't play music on the set um because It'll, everybody has their own rhythms and yeah. some people get distracted by it some people right. you know the, uh, uh, it, it interrupts their process right. so every we we really didn't have a lot of that um during the scenes but you know yeah. we would add that later and, and things yeah, there's also obviously technical reasons you don't yeah this, it drives the sound guys music. nuts i know that but back, back yeah. to the ice cube thing uh one yeah. of our one of our viewers on youtube sent in a comment and saying ice cubes are a lot cheaper than digitally removing the breath good call <laughs> <laughs> well it, it it only it only minimized the amount of breath we had to remove because there were scenes where we just couldn't do it um the other problem is the ice cube trick only works for about 15 to 30 seconds oh, okay. if your scene goes longer than that your breath is starting to start coming back because they can't hold the ice cubes in their mouth the whole time i would think it'd be good um, for maybe a close-up maybe yeah yeah i mean that's what you try to use wow. them for because those are the toughest things but you know you get a crowd scene <laughs> and uh we had we had we had one day where we were trying to shoot just a a, a horse riding down the street um, right. this, you know, a Turkish rider with a horse running down the street and we set up and we set up, we get ready to set, get ready to shoot. It's overcast. And we're like, okay, well, can we make this look sunny in the, in, in the color, color timing? Yeah, we can maybe do that. And we're getting ready to shoot. And all of a sudden I start seeing all this white stuff falling and it's snow. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and, and so there's these, there's this, there's a shot of this, you know, it takes, it was supposed to be happening in like autumn and it's overcast and this horse is right. riding through and there's snow falling. And oh I'm thinking, God. and my mind, my mind was immediately going, okay, you know, we either can stop shooting or we should try to get a take or, and, 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 and then I'll figure out how right. to digitally remove the snow. <laughs> Cause I had, I started, I was you, wow. you, you, uh, to your question. Um, I was starting to think immediately on, Oh, okay. I know that snow is different on every frame. That means that where the snow is in one frame is not where it is in the next frame. So I'm wondering if I can do some kind of calculated difference with, you know, in other words, I'm going through this technical right. optical process in my head of, is it possible for me to remove the snow from the scene? You know, but then it got, then it started really snowing. <laughs> and at that point it's like, okay, you can't, Get rid of right. you can get rid of maybe some falling snow, but you can't get rid of a blizzard. <laughs> so we had to not shoot that, and, and we ended up not needing it in the film. Thank goodness, but right, it was right. of course. It's yeah, it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy process. We did do some rain removal. Uh -huh. We had we had one scene that took place at night, the one that was around the campfire at night, where right. he gives the inspirational speech, and we had um, 
we had rainstorms going in and out torrential wow. rainstorms so we're you know we're walking in like a foot of mud mm. and and we had to shoot the scene by the campfire and we all the cameras are covered with plastic and, right. and our actors are out there shivering and we they got little tent things for them to go into where they're heaters yeah. and and we've got we've got casey and our and our uh, ad's using an app called dark skies that actually tracks you know weather by Right. Doppler radar, right. and and it's like okay, it looks like it looks like there's an opening coming in in the clouds. They think it's going to be about 15 minutes. Get everybody up there, and we shoot for 15 minutes, and then the rain start coming down again, and we have to, you know, pull pull back into the tents and yeah. everything. It's it's crazy. Um, but. so so I'm so it's Melissa again. Um, mm -hmm. really quick. So we have another question. I think I already know the answer to this, but I just want you to okay. say it yourself. Okay. Um. The question is, uh, did the director say, you, did Van say where in Greece they filmed? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we shot, um, we shot in a part of Greece that's really far removed from the rest of Greece. <laughs> How far? We shot, in, we shot in the state of New Mexico in the United States, and we shot um, in areas around the state between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Right. And then we shot the other half of the film in Santa Fe where our Greek village was actually located at an abandoned high school in the middle of downtown Santa Fe. Wow. Um, so, which is kind of crazy. Um, so, so given that you shot in New Mexico now, I want to, I want to go back to about, uh, I love, I love hearing all the stories about the special effects tricks yeah. and things like that. But um, back to what made you decide to want to uh, have this film be your directorial debut after so many years of being not the person in charge? <laughs> well, um, I think that, you know, just, just watching that process yeah. over the years and, you know, I've, I've had the, I've had the opportunity to work with, you know, all sorts of different directors from, you know, Paul Verhoeven and Jim to, to, um, um, gosh, Jan de Bont, uh, and Jim being James things. Cameron, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. James Cameron. And, and yeah, and I mean, it was, he was, part, it was part of you always thinking I could do this. Oh, heck no. <laughs> how'd you feel well, on mostly, day? How'd you feel well, on day one? It, <laughs> well, most of it was, yeah, most of it was, you know, how in the world did they do this? And it's not, <laughs> it's, it's a combination of understanding, knowledge, experience, but also having a vision and more importantly, the perseverance to try to get that vision because there's right. so many things get thrown at you to yeah. try to, you know, intentional or non-intentional that right. make it so difficult to kind of say, well, you know what, we're not getting quite what I want. We'll just go with that. Let's compromise with that. And you have to deal with that and figure out, okay, when are you going to compromise or when are you going to say, no, I want this over right. here instead of over there. And yeah, it'll take half an hour to right, move it right. to where you should have put it in the first place. <laughs> but, oh, I know but, what that's you, like. but you have to understand. Yeah, exactly. And you have to understand that, Half an hour is one sixteenth of your work day. Oh my god! That's right, and that's a huge amount of time. That say ninety percent of the people on your crew are standing around waiting right. for right. this to get done. I've always I've always joked that this is what being a uh, movie is like. Ninety nine percent of the time, you are standing around, especially if it's a union show like our show was. Ninety nine percent of the time, you are standing around waiting for one person to do their job. The other 1% of the time, you are that person. <laughs> and everyone else is waiting on you. So, right. um, so, so how this came to be my directorial debut really comes down to, once again, Casey Cannon, my producer. Mm -hmm. she, she came on to this project to help the Greek financier, Marianne Metropolis, who had come up with this story that she wanted to do, but she's not in the film business. She had the story that she wanted to do and she had been trying to work, get producers and work with them. And, and none of them, you know, were really interested. Now, they, that's interesting. You know, okay. Now. Okay. So I, cause I, I'm, I have a, I have a purpose. I'm asking these questions. Mm -hmm. I, I found, I, um, not myself, but 
someone that I've come to know over the past couple of years from being a guest on the show uh, tur- finds out that she has some Greek lineage in, in her. She had no idea she was adopted, any of this type of stuff. So when I went to, when I went to see the film last week with Neil, um, that's how I was, I was watching it for his, for its historical uh uh, yeah, purpose. So, is the story is it based on reality, or the, is yeah. well? The, let's put it this way: it is a fictional. Uh, it's a fictional primary story that's set against the historical backdrop of right. actual events and actual history. The idea was, it, you know, it's kind of like if you look at Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Scarlet and and Rip Butler are all fictional characters, but. The Civil War was real. Antebellum South was real, you know, and the culture in that time was real. Right. So the idea was to kind of get that right and then fit your fit your characters and the story you want to specifically tell, because people are affected by historical events, yeah. but they're emotionally affected by characters, by people. Right. And so you want to tell a story that people can relate to. You know, right. and you put it in you put in the context of the culture. And in this particular instance, we had fictional main characters, but a number of the characters portrayed in the film are real characters. General Colocotronis, the the oh, guy okay. with the, the hat, he was right. a real he was a real person, and he was he was and is considered a, a national hero of Greece because he was the one who united all of these right. rebel bands. Okay. To uh, to become, you know, the the fighting force that they were able to become. The opening scene with uh, the women going over the cliffs with their children, that was based on a real event. It happened in wow. 1803 where uh, Turkish uh, the Turks had cornered these women from a village and they were uh, chased them up. Uh, they, they had fled up in the hills and they Amen. came to a, a promontory where there was no no way out. And rather than submit to capture and, and assault and enslavement, and they chose else, yeah. to dance off the cliff. And that is like one of those defining moments in modern Greek cultural history. Wow. And and so we wanted to pay homage to that, you know, and then, of course, come back to it, you know, circle back to it. Spoiler later in the alert. Film. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, the opening is fantastic. The ending is unbelievable. I will say that. Well, no spoilers. No spoilers. No, no, on the, no. Uh, on the, but on the I was broadcast. actually, I was actually on the phone today with uh, the the person that I was just referring to, and mm-hmm. I described to her that scene. The end. At, no, the one the at the end. beginning. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. And just trying to describe it to her, I broke. I broke out into tears like it's I am really right now. Powerful. It's really, really powerful. <laughs> and well, um, I mean, it has the power. It has the power of truth behind it. Um, the, the concept. Now, we specifically imagined a different copycat event, right. so that the the actual historical events did happen in the storyline of our film. This was a copycat event that happened five years later, uh-huh. where. That, you know, because a lot of people, a lot of Greeks were inspired by this. Not that they all jumped off cliffs in right. droves, but they were inspired <laughs> by the fact that there were these strong women who said, we choose freedom from enslavement. We choose death if we can't have freedom. Right. And so that was a huge, that was a huge inspiration to a lot of, a lot of Greeks, you know, and it showed kind of how badass the women were. Oh yeah, um, yeah. The to, star to, of this to, movie, to have, or, or the lead yeah. girl, is truly yeah. a badass, Tanya. Yeah, yeah. And the the other thing about it was we had the interesting balance of trying to be historically accurate in the way patriarchal societies and cultures treat women, versus the way we knew we wanted to portray Anna Christina, because. As you know, most patriarchal societies basically treated women like property. Right, subhuman. Yeah. Or as social bargaining chips. Right. Where it's like, hey, marry this off for benefit to the family and, and so on. And it was, it, you know, the Greeks, like most of the cultures in history, were different. And it was like, okay, how do you, how do you show that yeah. without pissing everybody off, even though they know it's historically accurate? Right. Um, 
and how do you then create a character that becomes a strong character who can exist in that world without seeming like an anachronism right you know because we want to see today we expect our women to be strong and and you know you know have have the kind of moxie to you know demand equal rights and to you know do these things whereas in those days that wasn't something that was you know really the way it was so one of the things i'm proudest of in our storytelling was we kind of showed the evolution of that Mm. of how she became that and the truth of the matter is there were a number quite a number of legendary greek women who fought for the revolution and they were some badasses like one of them was like a, <laughs> one of them was like a sea captain wow who owned her own fleet what wow and yeah she because uh, she inherited it for, from her husband who was killed by albanian pirates and so she ended up getting it and then making it even bigger and stronger. Wow. And she was, she was so badass that she was given, uh, she was given, um, a commission in the Russian Navy. She wow. became like a, she, she became a commissioned, like, I'm not sure if it was an admiral or, a, you know, something in wow. admiralty in the Russian Navy. And she was that badass to the point where the, the Turks, the Ottomans at that point, hated her and called her a pirate because they said, well, illegally could be the only way she could have that kind of power. Right. right. So there's so there's some amazing there's some amazing Greek warriors and fighters. So we weren't going too far off the reservation to to talk about that. Right. And of course, you know, the Greeks who actually go see the film, uh, who, who aren't turned off immediately by the idea of a Greek girl falling in love with a Turk. Which right. is a stumbling block for apparently a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, actually, actually, a, a comment that just uh, came in um, says that the Turks expelled Istanbul Greeks from from the country, and mm -hmm. this person who wrote this says her father was a child at the time, and he was one of those that was expelled from the country. Yeah. Um, so that's that a, the mixed blood, right? Yeah. yeah, that would have been, yeah, that, that's a lot of this modern history, for, you know, from the 1800s and so on. Um, there's a lot of understandable concern because if your family history includes things like that, yeah. then you grew up with a set of values that's based on your family's personal experience. I totally respect that. And that, though, is also the way that hatreds are perpetuated. Right, because it, they take it too many generations. Yeah, and that's why you wonder, how, you know, if we're so enlightened today, and why is it that we have kids today who don't have to, who break away from the same old cultural hatreds? We all have, like, family members who, like, maybe yeah. were racist or maybe were, you know, you know for whatever right. purpose, because that's where their culture was when they grew up. You know, my my mom went through, you know, grew up in China being bombed by the Japanese. Right. So she always had a little bit of of standoffishness towards right. Japanese. Right. And so you kind of understand that. But you, you look at today and she'll say something about something or whatever. And you'll you'll kind of go, yeah, you know, thank God we're beyond that. But ultimately, we're not, because depending on how strong your family culture and your family tree is, it may be you were taught from birth. Mm -hmm. All Turks are evil. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a you know? there's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot in your movie that's about honor. You know, the mm -hmm. honor of your of your family and uh, and yeah. upholding the honor and avenging stuff. And yeah. it's, it's really you know it's it runs very deep. I, I think well, it's as as um, I I know some other people have re, uh, compared this to, but the Star Cross Lovers. Like Romeo mm -hmm, and Juliet. I mean, when I was when yeah. I was watching it, I was thinking, well, first, first I was, I was like, wow, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know how? Okay, am I a jaded LA audience person? Am I going <laughs> to like this movie? And of course, I did. I love it. Um, I haven't stopped thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. And now I understand why Neil was so. Uh, you know, insistent upon uh, talking about it because we, he actually, Neil actually came onto my show two weeks ago and talked about it. And right. then, you know, and then last week 
you know, we went and saw the screening. So, so the, fi- we, the we, final, we, final yeah, cut, we, yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Not Neil and I, but my guest, Brian Sebastian, who is a film critic. He and I talked about it. And now we're talking about it again this week. So it is a really. We love it. Yeah, it does. It. it And I and what I. But Neil said he was like, oh, it's going to be so gory. You know, well, I, I, <laughs> and, I said, and be so- prepared <laughs> for a little bit of fake blood. Well, sorry, blood. All right. Here and there, yeah. because it does it does get a little brutal at times. But that's well, I think here's the here's the funny here's the irony about this. There have been a lot of people who, just based on the premise mm-hmm. of of the of the main plot, not the right. not the history, but just the main plot of uh, a, a Greek girl who who falls in love with a Turkish officer, they immediately hated. The, the very idea right. of the movie and what they would say is and they would go on about how this would never happen and and they would spend their time in these posts just talking rightly so about here's all the atrocities the Turks did right. to us and all this kind of stuff and they listed off pretty much everything we show in the movie right. <laughs> so you know you think if they went and saw the movie they'd actually like it because we don't try to deny those right. events happened and we we that's folded into the, the fabric of the story right well and 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 in a very you know, uh humanity, storytelling. Yeah. yeah one in one one-on-one humanity doesn't have to be that way our characters say i do not believe that's the only way right right you know um i what i without giving anything away um what I loved as a female who uh, who loved the love story portion of it, um, when he recognizes her eyes without realizing he's recognizing her eyes. Right. right. We don't want to say much. More, <laughs> right. We're not going to say much more. But uh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and that was one of the things. You know, the the financier was very adamant about having striking blue eyes. Wow. Oh, and wow. and so you know, we had to uh, do it. You had to, had to do a search for a, 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 an actress. You know, must have striking blue eyes. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we so we um, so we brought in Tanya, who was so fantastic. To the she's really good, and she has brown eyes. So <laughs> she's, so she's so she's wearing contacts. Uh, um, see you. You did your job well yeah, exactly. so far. Everything that I've said, you're just like so you thought. <laughs> No, you, could, you could add a brown eyed girl in the snow. <laughs> so you well, that thought. Was, well, that was the magic. That's the magic of movie making, to be honest. I mean, it was. It's always a. It's always a challenge yeah. because I'd rather have somebody who's a really good actress and can hit the hit that character the way that you want her to be portrayed, right. and you know, fix the vision, the cosmetic things, than to have somebody who's you know looks exactly the part but can't. Can't, can't pull act. off the, right. the yeah pull off the characterization right. so you know but yeah well, I mean, so it's we about looked, the performance I mean it's it got, yeah. ultimately got to be about the performance yeah I have another question yeah. <laughs> yeah um how did you how did you did you have the love story and you mm-hmm. have the battle sequence yeah the battle so- yeah, the big battle sequence. Yeah, you know, we had a couple battle sequences, but the big battle sequence at the end was based on an actual event, mm-hmm. and it was the Battle of Altetzi in 1821, and it was one of the first most significant battles of the Greek War of Independence because it was the first time that the Greeks were able to show that a ragtag band of freedom fighters were able to defeat. A, a larger, a much larger and more organized Ottoman right. army. And that was one of the things that gave the Greeks the impetus to keep going. Because they had been fighting, remember, they had been occupied for nearly 400 right. years. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Ottoman Empire took over Constantinople and made it Istanbul back in 1453. So now we're in eighteen. We're in eighteen twenty-one, and they have been, you know, fighting. There, there have been uprisings and rebellions for years, where the Greeks were trying to, you know, rise up and take right. over, and they always got beaten back down. And so this was the first time that they started getting organized a little more and trying to become 
uh, who they ultimately wanted to be, which was a, a free country again. Well, you really root for them, right? You know, yeah. I mean, there's it's a clear yeah. it's a clear cut uh, division, you know. Well, you know, revolutions and rebellions never go out of style in the movies. <laughs> it's really, it's, isn't that interesting? I mean, yeah. we we do we do movies about that all the time, and part of that, especially in America, is because that's how our country was born. Right. And, yeah. and what's really fascinating about this portion of Greek history for me, coming to it as an American, is that the the whole idea of the the American Revolution, then followed by the French Revolution, and then the kind of transition from just a straight up monarchy to, you know, parliamentary, you know, democracy mm -hmm. in, in England, and those kind of things, those were events that were all about getting to some kind of democracy, and, you know, equal treatment of citizens, and all this, or at least more equal treatment yeah. of citizens, um, and all of them said, wow, we love this idea of not just being under a king or a queen. Who came up with this whole democracy thing? <laughs> and they would say, it was the Greeks. Oh, yeah. And all of these countries said, wow, we love right. the Greeks. They came up with this. How are the Greeks doing these days? Uh, well, they don't have a country anymore, and they're <laughs> un they're enslaved by the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah. and they were and cut down from 20 million to 1 million. Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. that's, what, that's what they said in the propaganda in the film. Um, the truth of the matter is, which they didn't know, which is why I didn't change mm -hmm. it, is that there was probably only 4 million Greeks in the whole country at that time. But it, it you know, the, the, the main thrust of it is true that right. there were, you know, a lot of people were killed and mm -hmm. that they were getting to the numbers where they could possibly be exterminated. Mm -hmm. And if you, and if you look at the Armenian, um, situation uh that happened almost 100 years later mm -hmm. there was this idea let's just get rid of these people mm -hmm. and yeah. and so there there's a lot of the, the armenian genocide there was a lot of this kind of thing and what was interesting to me was that they looked at these european countries who had gone transitioned out of monarchies and and dictatorships into democracy loved the idea of the greeks having created this and they looked at how greece was no longer a country that invented democracy did not have freedom of its own and they started campaigning hmm. for democracy in greece and for greece to become free again and so there was this confluence of things it, and and you had people like lord byron who famously fell behind the the Greek fell into the Greek cause? He spent the majority of his fortune and actually died in Greece, trying to help them. Um, so and and, and in the, along the way, he wrote poems talking of you know decrying the fact that the country that created democracy doesn't have democracy of its own. Uh, mm -hmm. Delacroix, the painter, did paintings of you know depicting Greece and its enslavement and everything. So there was this kind of almost social media style PR going on <laughs> outside of Very Greece, early. which is yeah. really fascinating, which is really fascinating. And they were trying to help spread the word. And you had Greeks who had left the country to go to university, who then in these European university were like, hey, we love you guys because you're <laughs> Greek. And they used that to help leverage support for right. hey why don't we try to get our countries to pressure the ottoman empire to set greece free right. and um, that became this okay. big historical issue too um stop hitting the table <laughs> um so going back to now when when i was there at the screening and i was eavesdropping mm -hmm. at various people coming up to casey <laughs> the producer and yep. giving them their um Per, not perspective, but their their impression of you know their reaction to the film, and someone came up there came up to her and said that it reminded them of Star Wars, and and another <laughs> and another person who just commented in the live chat also said Star Wars. Hmm. So uh, did you feel like you were doing a version of Star Wars at all when <laughs> you were making this film? Well, you know what? If I did, it would have been completely unconscious because obviously I take my job seriously enough yeah. that uh, as much as I would love to kind of make something in the mold of my favorite movies, you know, because I'm a science fiction guy. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Star Wars. You know, it was one of the seminal events in my life. Yeah. And 
So, um, so that's a compliment to you. Yeah, I mean that I would. I am thrilled that somebody would compare. You know that they saw a bit of Star Wars in the movie. That would be. That's that's an uh, honor. I I I'm very uh, I'm very uh, humbled by. But um, what that just tells you is that the story of rebellions, you know, fighting right. for freedom against oppressive regimes, is a universal concept, and it's something that we all can kind of relate to, in right. one way or another. So there's there's that sense of universality that we want to get out of this film. One of the challenges in making this film is that there have been films made about this period in Greece, certainly, and in Turkey from a different point of view, yeah. uh, but there's never really been movies made about this particular period in Greek history in in the, the you know commercial mainstream Hollywood right. you know domestic market and that's that's always been a challenge and the ones that have been trying to touch upon this don't do very well because i think a lot of people think oh well nowadays you do everything where they speak the actual languages and they right. use they would speak in greek and turkey had we done it that way which meant the whole film would have been subtitled okay, right? which would have meant the whole film would have been treated as a foreign film and we wanted to try to make it accessible to mm -hmm you know, domestic audiences while also paying homage to, right. you know, the, you know, the Greek audiences. And that's why we chose to do it in English, you know, and to have uh, a whole international cast of actors. Right. The cast, um, the cast is fantastic. Yeah. And we do have Greeks contrary to what some people <laughs> seem to think on the internet. We had, you know, quite a number of Greeks who were in, in some of the roles, you know, right. For some odd reason, no Turks actually wanted to be in this movie. So. <laughs> I, wanted, I was going to ask about that. Like, what is the reaction of the flip side? So they didn't want to be in it, and well, and they also I, here's this. Let me let me just give you an idea of some of the reaction I you know, we got. We when we had put out some casting information, uh, you know, to try to you know look at. We, we cast a wide net. We looked at a lot of Greeks. We looked at a lot of Turks. We we or we you know talked right. to them. We got this one email from a Turkish woman who basically said, I read your story plot line with, with some amusement. I do not think you know Turkish history. There are no such things as Greeks. We killed them all. Oh, my God. Oh. So, oh my so God. you can, so again, wow. she, I, I will not say she is representative of like every Turkish. Oh, oh say it. But, no, it's okay. Say but, it. But, but you see what I mean? It was, it, it was, so there's a spectrum and there's the same thing with Greeks. There are Greeks who are going to look at this movie, certainly before they see it and say, and they have online, I would never see a movie about this because it's, it's totally fictional. You know, wow. a Greek girl would never fall in love with a Turk after what the Turks had done to the Greek people. And if she did, her parents would be in the right to honor kill her for it. Say no more. That, I have <laughs> I mean, seen. I have seen oh, quite a number of posts that say that, boy, and you heavy. and you kind of want to say, well, maybe you should think about seeing the movie before you make that that right. judgment. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. They're but, making an assumption. Wow. Right there. Wow. Yeah. And so, but so there's a spectrum of responses. That's one of the amazing things. That's one of the actually one of the most frustrating and hilarious things I found in working with, uh, working with and and working and and showing the movie to Greeks is that the old joke, and even our financier Marianne told me this joke. She said, if you put two Greeks in a room, you will have three opinions. And what happened was, you know, she said, you know, we have a historical consultant. We have, you know, I'm Greek or my husband's Greek. We have some Greek actors on the show and everything. So when you're in doubt, Van, if you're not sure how it should be played culturally, ask a Greek. And I said, sure. Perfect, not a problem. And so I would ask Greek, and they would tell me, "Oh, do it this way, and we'll do it this way," and you know, and that's what we did. And then we'd find out later that another Greek looked at it and said, "Oh, no, 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 that's not the right way to do it." Okay, we made it. We made a huge deal of, of making sure that in the film, the way that the Greek Orthodox um, uh, people cross themselves right. is in is flopped from how the Roman Catholics do. 
you know, where it's okay. up, it's up, down, right, left, instead of up, down, left, right, which is the Roman Catholic way. So we made sure we redid takes, we did all sorts of things just to make sure that we tried to get everybody that we could, who, who was doing that on camera, to do it correctly. And so I was very proud that we were able to you know, make sure that happened. And I had people on set saying, this is really great that you're making sure that this, you know, we're crossing the right way. Right. And so, you know, we previewed the movie to some, uh, to a Greek audience in New Zealand where we were doing our post. Um, and they came back at the end of the movie and said, oh, we love the movie, but, you know, you're doing the cross all wrong. And I said, really? Um, I thought we did it the right way. You know, it's like, you know, it's right, left instead of left, right. And somebody, another Greek patron came up and said yeah it's, it's all wrong and the first one said yeah you're supposed to do it this way and they they did it at a different speed uh -huh. oh and their God. fingers were held at a slightly different attitude and they did it and they said yeah it should be this way and the other greek said no 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 it should be this way and the two of them started arguing amongst themselves about how it should be done but the only thing they agreed on was that i had done it wrong <laughs> oh! <laughs> and, I, and I said to them, I told them the joke about the three opinions, mm -hmm. and they just laughed and said, "That's democracy for you." Wow! Wow! So did so, so what did you do? Did you just leave it? Did you have to go well, back and did you reshoot the oh, those scenes? Yeah, but to what? That's like the, <laughs> you know, the, you know, because remember these were one person's opinion and then another person's opinion right. and then another person's opinion, and it was it was kind of interesting and. That's actually the beauty of the culture and the democracy is that that sense of, you know, we're not all lockstep. We're independent right. thinkers. We all have different ideas of how to do things. And that's kind of what helped them survive, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's but it's really it's really interesting to see how those things that like we value independence, but we also know how messy independence and democracy can be because right. of it right you know because everybody has their own opinion then who gets you know how do you get things done you know if everybody it's like herding cats yeah. well, <laughs> and, well, and, <laughs> and, and to be honest one of the biggest challenges for the greek war of independence was once they started winning they started arguing amongst themselves <laughs> on how they should how they should move forward. There was a whole faction yeah. that said, "You know what? We're now got the upper hand. Let's do to the Turks what they did to right. us," right. and wanted to slaughter everybody. And then there was another that said, "You know, if we do that, we're going to be just like them, and we should be, you know, letting their women and children go and letting this." But but if you came from a family where some of your family members weren't there anymore right. because they were killed by Turks. You might be a part of that fashion that says kill them all. Right. And right. so there's this whole big kind of, again, universal, you know, set of opinions, different opinions. So I respect that. So even when I see, you know, really hateful reviews and hurtful reviews and, or non reviews, just statements mm -hmm. based on, you know, one person saying, Oh, it's this kind of movie. I understand it, and I all all I can do, and all Casey can do is, you know, and our finance can do. We can put out the movie and say, "You judge for yourselves." Right now, because, okay. yeah. sorry. No, go, um, no, go. uh, now going to to the cast of the film, you have mm -hmm. such a, a diverse and well known. Like you have Christopher Plummer. Patty yeah. Lapone. Patty Lapone. Like when I, you know, when I was on, uh, when I was. Uh, before I knew you were going to be the guest, um, I was still, you know, tweeting out stuff about the movie posters and the and mm -hmm. seeing the movie and stuff. And so I was on Twitter looking up different names: Billy Zane, mm -hmm. Patty Lapone, uh, part yeah. Costas Mandalore. I, I yeah. Um, and I was the people. Pe there's people that talk about these these performers on a daily basis, you know, mm -hmm. and and the reaction. Of people, the Broadway people for Christopher Plummer and Patty yeah. Lapone being yeah. in this film. So, how did that? Feel, how did you acquire them? Did 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 uh, were, did you already have? Did someone already have them in mind to be in the film, or did they read it and want to be a part of it? How did that work out? Well, we were so fortunate to get Christopher Plummer because you know he was he was he had just won an Oscar for Beginners mm -hmm. the year before and. And we wanted somebody who could play wise, you know, kind of, kind of our, 
our Gandalf, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, right. and, you know, we were so lucky he read the script and was attracted to it. It's a small part, right. but it's a significant one. And the fact that he was willing to do it was fantastic. And, and, so and he had to be available thrilling. as well. Right? Yeah. And, and to be available and, you know, scheduling is like half the battle because he is, he was 86 years old when he made our movie. And he'd be willing and, to go to freezing New Mexico. Yeah. And, <laughs> and to do all this stuff. And it's because he, you know, he believed in the film and he, uh, you know, for some odd reason, trusted me. And that was a first timer. And, you know, he's worked with everybody. Yeah. So I was, I was humbled and honored and obviously intimidated, but he was so, he was so nice and uh, respectful and really funny on the set he was he was he was always helping put people at ease because you know i guess he knows people right. kind of freak out how, how did you yeah. how did you feel the first time you had to kind of coax a performance out, out of him or have him do it a, a, different, a different way, way. than he had it oh yeah frame. he was razzing me the first day we worked was because <laughs> of his because of the schedule the first thing we shot was his death scene <laughs> Uh, spoiler. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But we had to we had to play that we had to play a scene that you know right. wasn't for you know the beginning of the movie. It was for later in his character's development. Mm-hmm. So maybe you can fix that one. That'd be uh, like Bohemian but, Rhapsody yeah. when they had to do yeah. Live Aid uh, with the first scene, right, Neil? Oh, yeah. what, you mean when they filmed it? Yeah. 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 I heard that schedule. They started with the Live yeah. Aid concert. So yeah. that had to be what, like seven, eight shoot days. I, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's always tough. But that's one way you dive in, and oh, then you yeah, back you up dive and dive in. All right. Yeah, yeah, and so you know that was that was always a, a challenge. So he was he was really great to work with, and Patty was one of my favorite and only choices I wanted for the part of Yaya. And it came down to her and one other actress that uh, the that the financier chose and that person kind of fell out and I was so thrilled because that meant I could go and ask Patty and I had been a fan of Patty since Evita right. in 1980 on Broadway. Wow. The original. And, Evita. Yeah. And she was, she was just wonderful. Um, and she came in, she, she was, you know, people talk about her being a diva and she's not a diva at all, you know, she can be when she needs to be and she'll do it on your behalf. She's earned the right, you know? Yeah. And she was, she's, she was great. She's in, she's doing company, the Stephen Somhain musical in London right now. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, and, uh, and she's, she was just fantastic. I I love, love, love working with her. (laughs) So, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. (laughs) And we have Billy Zane who, uh, who who is Greek. He's actually Spartan. Oh, really? and uh, so we wanted. I was looking for all the Greek Americans that I could find. So you, know? you obviously, you must have had you had a previous working relationship with Billy Zane from Titanic, then, right? Well, we never had any scenes together, but uh, <laughs> I did. I did know him. Uh, I, we were acquainted from that show, right. and uh, and you know he he has made a living playing these kind of morally dubious characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a good and way to put it. Morally dubious. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and people, people don't give him enough credit for being layered in the way he tries to do it. I mean, he, he really worked uh, with me a lot to try to make this particular character of Christo, not just completely reprehensible that you could see the twinges of, you know, right. of guilt in moments. Yeah. Right. And, and at the point where it's just like, okay, do I feel guilty about this or do I just be a survivor and do whatever I have to do? And there's all sorts of different layers that he he really, you know, brought to that character. And the same with Raza Jaffrey, who who plays Sunal. The, oh, right. The kind right. Of main yeah, film. he was cool. He, oh, he's fantastic. Yeah, we, I, one of the proudest things in, in the writing of the script was making him this reprehensibly evil character to some extent, but at the same time, hopefully get people to understand just how much he respects and cares for his, you know, his comrade, Tarek, I, um, and, and what he's willing to do. And I think also it, it, it shows two sides of two different people who both have mixed blood and yeah. how one person felt a certain way and another person felt the other way without yeah. giving anything away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those kind of, those kind of, 
like levels that I wanted to put in this to try to, you know, elevate it from being, you know, a lot of stock characters. I, I love how um, at the beginning or, you know, his, his introduction onto the screen also, you know, remember again, I'm, I'm viewing it as a, I was a jaded LA <laughs> person watching it going, who is this guy? Cause like, you just, the silhouette. And I'm like, what's on his head? What has he got a bag on his head? Like, what <laughs> is that? And then to have it come through and, and then you get the shot of, of what it is. And you're just like, wow. Yeah. That those were, those, that's a historically impressive. accurate Janissary hat. Okay. They had these giant, what looked like sleeves with spoons on them. You know, uh -huh. and and there is an actual reason for that. The way the Janissaries came to be were they originally started as non-Turks who were slaves, who were loyal as kind of the secret service to the Sultan. And the cloth that looks like a sleeve was meant to represent they were at the right hand sleeve of the Sultan. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that front metal thing looks like a spoon mm -hmm. is because one of the things they did for the Sultan was to do kitchen duty to make sure that the Sultan's meals weren't poisoned. Wow. Uh, early secret <laughs> service. So, <laughs> so there's a, so there's some fascinating history wow. behind this stuff. And it was, uh, that was one of the really cool things. I love history. I love doing research. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge here is that there's a lot of disagreement as to what happened in this period of history. Because if you ask a Greek from one area, they'll say one thing. They'll, mm -hmm. If you ask a Greek from another area, they'll say, no, it didn't happen that way. It happened this way. If you ask a Turk, obviously, you'll have a completely different opinion. Mm -hmm. So... You know, there are there are certain things that people agree on. There's certain things that people don't agree on, and uh, it was it was interesting to kind of dive into that. Do you think that um, that you now having done so much re research on Greek culture and Greek history, do you think that you might embark upon another project that that has to do with something like that? For instance, um, you know, uh, there's this whole. I don't know if a lot of people know about this, but there's an adoption things that, that, that I don't know what you, what, how to, um, how, what, how to re refer to it. But, uh, you know, that a lot of people don't know about is that, that a lot of, uh, babies have been adopted out of Greece and the Greek mothers mm -hmm. have been told that their children are dead. Mm -hmm. And that, wow. that is like rampant. It's sort of like a, non an unknown thing that's just coming to that, light well that i'm finding out yeah. just because of the person who told me and her situation it because she's yeah. one of them and so you know it is you know do you think that that you might end up being sort of a um i don't know activist what's the word i'm looking for uh i don't i don't know if that's i mean i one activist. thing i've well one thing i've learned from doing this is that I think that there's such a rich history that can be explored that mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping that our film will inspire other filmmakers to kind of, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't consider this my turf because yeah, you know, it's okay. somebody else's culture. And I think it would be great if, if more Greek filmmakers or fi American Greek filmmakers chose to explore some of those parts of their culture, because we're also in an age right now where it's kind of like, Oh, if you're not of this ethnicity, right. you have no right to make movies about this ethnicity. Right. Right. But, <laughs> you know? but, but you had, right. So, so, so back to the, the person who, uh, Marianne, who, who mm -hmm. wrote this, um, I mean, how did she feel about having someone not of her ethnicity telling the story? Well, she's the one who picked me. Oh. for doing this this is what's oh, interesting right. this is well this is what's interesting um casey okay. started working for uh marianne to help her get this movie done she came in as a producer and she was the only one to pull this off and it's because she said you know what you have a project you're trying to do my job is to help you figure out how to do it and you know, she, she, she likes a good underdog story. So she <laughs> tried to, she tried to come in and, and help Marianne do that. And along the way, you know, she, she would ask me, Oh, you know, we're dealing with some story issues, some story questions, you know, how would you deal with, you know, do you have any ideas on how we could deal with this, how to get from point A to point B in Marianne's story? Because again, 
she doesn't work in the film business, so she doesn't know the story structure kind of things that we deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, oh, you know, maybe you could do this and this. And she'd say, great, can you write that down? So I'd write that down, and and then it would be my story notes became, dialogue revisions became, beat sheets became, uh, you know, ultimately I had end up doing a full page one rewrite yeah. of the entire script. Uh -huh. And so I kind of started getting invested in it. Um, you know, Casey's been working on it since probably 2010, 2011. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. And I started working on it around 2011 as a consultant. And then mm. I ended up becoming a, the, the, the principal writer, you know. And wow. then um, I was there to support the director candidates that they would bring in and say, oh, you know, well, we want to maybe do this or, you know, let's go on a scout or whatever. And you know, we couldn't get it, we couldn't really get it worked out with finding the right director. So they shelved the project for a year. Oh. And in that time, I tried to take all this research that I had done and anticipation of the fact that we would have to create all the costumes from scratch and the props and mm -hmm. everything because you can't rent them because nobody makes movies about this period. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a television series. Oh. based in this period so to answer your earlier question mm -hmm. i have thought about it uh marianne actually commissioned me to write something that could use you know to amortize all this stuff mm -hmm. and so i wrote a tv series and one of the things when you write a tv series proposal you know it's like you know 20 page document or whatever um that describes different plot lines different characters all sorts of things uh, that uh, that greek that greek um Russian Admiral Pirate Queen is one of my characters in that, by the way. Uh -huh. and, and um what happened was people said, Oh, well, if you're gonna do a proposal, you'll have a better luck, you know, getting getting it to people if you can show them something visual. So mm -hmm. it was like, why don't you put together a presentation reel? Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, shoot basically make a trailer. <laughs> right. You know? And so I was like, oh, okay, well, let me let me try to work on that. So Casey and I put together uh, I wrote like 26 pages mm -hmm. of shots and scenes and we spent four days in LA just shooting stuff for a trailer. And we found this house in Altadena that's out in the middle of the suburbs, just north of Pasadena that had this amazing Turkish recreation room in it. Wow. And so we shot there for a couple days and then we needed to show like exteriors and stuff and like the palace and things. And we found that location in all of all places, a cemetery in Compton <laughs> where the architecture of the cemetery was kind of middle Eastern. Right. And so we were able to shoot outside with these buildings and have it feel like you could be in Istanbul. And then we shot inside this giant mausoleum, you know, Westworld shot there too. That looked like a big palace, marble floors, tall ceilings, vaunted, you know, arches. And so we shot there for two days. And after she and, uh, you know, Marianne and her husband saw me doing this, you know, and directing this stuff, they were so excited that they said, we're putting the film, the film's back on <laughs> and we want you to direct it. You. So this thing not only wow. was a, presentation reel for this proposed series but it also became my audition wow, wow. what a story and that's how yeah. i what a that's story. how yeah and that's how i that's how i ended up directing this movie because she saw <laughs> that i understood you know right. kind of how to do this thing and so it was uh that was really interesting because i kind of it, it, it kind of took me aback because i never thought that she'd be like oh yeah we should we should do this but wow. again wow. the what person who made that all happen was right. casey well, we can, now we can add that into the trivia, you know, of what movies became a movie based on a trailer first. <laughs> You're now part of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was for a trailer for something completely different. Oh, so, yeah. Crazy. So, um, we've we've already been, we've already, you've been on the call already over an hour and you've given us so much time. Really, before we wrap up, um, I, I'm wondering, well, first where can people see this movie? I, I know tomorrow uh, there's a screening someplace different, which is part of the reason why you're at the lab well, dealing with it. Yeah. The well, the movie is currently in uh, a few theaters in New York right. and a few theaters in Los Angeles. We started there as a select release. So if you're in Los Angeles, you can see it at uh, the Universal City Walk 
over by Universal Studios, mm -hmm. which is a great location. And uh, you can also see it in Torrance uh, at the Rolling Hills 20. Um, it's also playing this week uh, for a few more days in the uh, uh, Orange County, uh, Orange 30, AMC Orange 30, down in Orange County, mm -hmm. City of Orange, near you know Anaheim, Disneyland, that sort of area. Um, and then this Friday, it's actually going to open in five more locations around the country. Uh -huh. So um, if you give me a second, I'll pull those up. Oh, sorry. So can, yeah. <laughs> no. Well, that's what America I want to know. Yeah, that's what I had seen that, 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 <clears throat> that there was uh, going to be, uh, it was expanding its, its um, release. Release, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for the people who have seen it, they seem to, uh, they seem to uh, enjoy it. And uh, well, I want as so many people as possible to yeah. go see yeah, it. Yeah, me too. I've seen it four yeah. times, and, and, I, and I know well, I'll go for opening, five. Just so you know, it's opening in Baltimore, in Chicago, oh, in in Dallas, Fort Worth, right. in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and in Washington D.C. Yeah. Oh, great! So one all of my those friends. cities will have one theater. One of That's our uh, okay. One of our one of my um, live stream moderators is in Chicago, and so we we're trying to find Excellent. a way to get him to see it um, as well. So that's good. Yay! Yeah. The, the, the DC uh, theater should be interesting. That should be an interesting audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. There's there there are um, there are, you know the Greek diaspora is everywhere, and there's a lot of com Greek communities in each of these right. towns, right? Right. Each of these cities. So. I, I actually, it's it's funny when I when I was doing a search the other day to see where it was playing to find out if it was playing in Chicago, and I did a Hey Siri, where's Clips of Freedom playing in Chicago? And it brings me up a, a Greek newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, "Wow, who knew my that they?" Oh, up uh, sorry, <laughs> Siri, just, yeah. Yeah. Siri, Siri just uh, answered my question. Uh, yeah, um, but so we're, I, we're hoping yeah. we're hoping that the Greek community will really come out and, and support the film, and that the ones who kind of knee jerk against the idea of a romance between a Greek and a Turk, hopefully they overcome that and, and realize that this is actually very respectful to the greek culture and that you know we had people standing up and cheering and and yelling out long live greece after the movie and wow. i've heard that in some theater like some theaters in new york where there was a large greek contingent who came to see it they were like standing ovation so oh, yeah oh. It's, well it's really I'm, inspirational and, yeah I mean, I'm, and i'm hoping that spreads to general audiences too because we didn't want to make something that was you know, that wasn't accessible and relatable. We wanted people of all, you know, cultures and, and you know, types to be able to enjoy it for the story and to, to kind of get into kind of it. And if nothing else, it'll help open dialogue, hopefully, right. about yeah. about things. Right. I saw some dialogue already on Facebook where uh, a, a Greek and a Turk just got into it and started calling names, calling, <laughs> calling each other names and... You guys are full of hate. Well, you guys, you know, did this. Yeah. And, you know, if nothing else, it gets them talking. Right. Yeah, that, that's it, true. Exactly. <laughs> that's very true. As opposed to plotting. So um, yeah. I know, Neil, if you have a couple more minutes, Neil had some off-topic uh, oh, um, questions he yeah. wanted to ask yeah. you. Yeah, well, I'm, I know that you're a music fan. <laughs> yeah. And I know you're a rock music fan. And uh, I had a couple of questions for you. One is, uh, is do you have a favorite rock and roll or rock and roll based movie that's a good question i haven't really thought about okay, that right. um, top two or I'll three have... even <laughs> uh, Bohemian no, I'm, just kidding. No. I'm kidding <laughs> gosh i'm not i'm not really sure that's that's okay. actually a good question well I, let me ask know, you I'm... this if you, if you had the opportunity to direct a movie about any rock band or singer or artist who would that be Oh gosh, that's a that's a tough one. I'd have to figure out the answer to the first question first, okay. wouldn't I? <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. All right. What okay. era? Here, let's go. Era. Uh, what well, era of music? Well, hang on. I, I, let's do it this way. Okay. I'm I'm gonna reel off some names of some movies, and you can kind of rate them from one to ten. Okay. Very quickly. <laughs> I'll probably embarrass okay. myself by having a hard seen day's night. Of... <laughs> a hard day's cool. night. That was one of the first albums I ever had as a as a, a vinyl. Okay, we're talking Actually, movies. We now. Vinyl. Right. We're talking movies. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we like that. How about help? Yeah. 
Help was good. Okay. How about uh, Stop Making Sense? Honestly, I haven't seen it. Okay. You know, it's, it's on a, my list. It's a talking heads. <laughs> yeah. How about yeah. uh, Catch Us If You Can? Catch Us If You Can. The Dave Clark Five movie. Oh. Haven't I don't think that. you've seen that. No. Um, uh, Spinal Tap. Definitely. Okay. Spinal Tap was really cool. Almost, so, almost famous. Right. Almost famous. Yep. <laughs> okay, and yeah. uh, I had a couple more on my list. I'm doing this from memory. Um, Are all these the ones you worked on? I know you worked on some of them. Uh, no, I worked on one of those. <laughs> Almost right. famous. Um, but I did. I do have a funny story about Spinal Tap. I, I got. Uh, I was assigned by a British magazine to to do a photo shoot with those three guys. You know, in costume and in character. So I went to the riot house, and I go to this room. Uh, you know, the famous Continental Hyatt House, and I go to this right. room where. The three guys introduced themselves to me uh, as their spinal tap. You know, they're wearing the wigs and everything, and they introduced themselves as Nigel Tufnell, et cetera, et cetera. Right. We do a whole shoot the whole day with them in the room up uh, on the roof at the pool. And then when after we wrapped, we were in the lobby, and the three of them had taken their wigs off and taken their costumes off, and they reintroduced themselves to me as Harry Shearer, <laughs> You know, Michael McKean. Michael McKean. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. They completely like played the part, and then were out of character. It was fantastic. That'd be messed up. Yeah. Yep. If I'm not mistaken, didn't they do a commentary on one of the discs as their character? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the kind of brilliance, and and those three guys in particular, Christopher Guest. One of my favorites. Again, it's not a rock music movie, right. but one of my favorites is A Mighty Wind. Oh, we saw that. <laughs> and, and part of that is because one of the things that I grew up with that my parents got don't, me don't. was the new Christy Minstrels. Right. I grew up with the new Christy Minstrels. And that's one of the things that bonded me with Casey, too, because she's like, oh, my God, I grew up listening to new Christy Minstrels also. So, oh, my God. Um, so the people. whole idea of folk music is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> folk, I mean, folk, folk music. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah, right. People don't people don't realize that um, uh, one of the songs from uh, A Mighty Wind was nominated for an Academy Award. The Kiss at the End of the Rainbow, the one that Catherine O'Hara and uh, Eugene Levy sing, and that song was written by Michael McKean and his wife Annette O'Toole. Okay, and so the yeah. two of them. So Michael McKean of Spinal Tap and, you know, Better Call Saul is an Academy Award nominee. Wow. Oh, interesting. I so, did not know which that. Is, which is really cool. That's, that's interesting. So, so well, yeah. I want to I want to thank you so much for, um, you know. Talking your ears off? Yeah. I mean, Neil, <laughs> well, I would, yeah, when I when I was on the station, you know, my show went for 50 minutes. And so the hook would have been out. Yeah, we exactly. It was like, we'd have to talk really fast. I always sounded like I was on, on, you know, super high speed uh, trying to get everything in. And people would say, wow, I wish I could come back because we didn't get a chance to really finish talking. But now having this, this uh, platform here and being a little bit more, uh, my flexible. own, yeah, yeah, more flexible. I'm finding that each week the show goes a little bit longer than the week before, but I yeah. try, I try to keep it under an hour and a half. So, mm -hmm. um, so I want to thank you yeah. for, for being so, uh, willing well, it's been and a pleasure. yeah. Yeah, uh, and, it, and we know you're pressed for time every day now with, with the release and everything. So, well, I want to say one more thing, which okay. is that Neil has been, you know, a fantastic support to us as well. And he, he came out to um, our sets before we uh, destroyed them, you know, before we, we struck the sets. Yeah, just before. Uh, out in, <laughs> yeah, out in, out in New Mexico. And uh, he shot a lot of pictures of, you know, a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, so he got to see, you know, our, our Turkish yeah. palace set that was, built on a baseball field <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was, it was fun it was fun it was a lot of work but you know i never you talk I never to him about some of that i never shy away from 16 hour days well you know he was trying to uh, before because he was a sponsor of my um the radio show before and so he had told me about this thing that he was about to go do and i was just like there's sets in the middle of new mexico what are you talking about like what and yeah. I was like, how long have they been sitting there? Aren't they oh, faded by now? Yeah. 
<laughs> you could go to Google Maps uh -huh. and actually look at the satellite view, and you'd see our set. Wow! On the baseball diamond, it's hilarious. Wow! Oh wow! I mean, you know? there's also no taxis in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and was it? I mean, I'm. That's. A, I guess this is a topic for another show too. But I imagine it might have been a little bit different working with a crew in New Mexico than one in LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean things are really different. I mean they have a they have a really good incentive, and there's some really fantastic crew that are in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had been able to work with more of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on yeah. over there. Well, and, it's, a, uh, it's a beautiful yeah. it's a beautiful part of the country, and and it shows on film. Uh, there's some beautiful stuff in in your movie, and you know I love it, and. Everyone out there, you got to go and see it and get your friends to go and see it. And it'll make you think and it will make you cry and smile and right. do all those things that a good movie does. And I know someone who who has been following along in the live stream who's of Greek descent appreciated this program very much. And so she said that we did a really good job right. and she thanked us. She said, I love how it turned out to be Spinal Tap in a Mighty Wind. <laughs> <laughs> In my world, all roads lead to Spinal Tap, or Tap. <laughs> tap, tap. It's, the, right. it's, it's the Kevin Bacon of, uh, of the rock. Uh, exactly. The oh, rock well, I could have mentioned the song remains the same. I mean, there's a million of them, but yeah, yeah we'll leave it at Spinal Tap. But thank you, thank you, Van Ling. Thank you so thank much. You. For having Great me. job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and, so uh, much. I, don't have I this. hope everybody gives the movie a chance. And. Uh, Thanks again for everything. Okay. Thank you. you and go. and you're welcome back whenever you want. <laughs> Absolutely. So and I'll much. see you soon. All right. Okay. Take All right. care. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. Fantastic. Okay, everybody. Everyone. So that was Van Ling, the director of Cliffs of Freedom. Cliffs of Freedom and uh you know, a ton of other things. So I a uh, great interview. Hope to see the film. So I thank you to my sponsor for investing in this item <laughs> right here. So I can actually uh, participate in the chat a little bit more. Um, thank you to each and every one of you. Who and thank you to Casey. And thank Casey you to Cannon. Casey, Casey Cannon, Cannon, who's homesick tonight. And boy, was she exhausted on Tuesday <laughs> when we saw her. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, a lot of lot of hard work went into yeah, this. Yeah. And and like I was I was saying when after the film was over and. <laughs> we didn't go into this part. <laughs> uh, I know what's coming here. <laughs> when I didn't know that any of the actors from the film were there, <laughs> and and uh, and Neil says, "Oh, do you want to meet? Uh, do you want to meet uh, the, the the lead? The lead? There's the, some the good colonel, looking guys, right? Do you want to meet the lead? Do you want to meet the colonel?" And I was like, movie. "Excuse me, he's here. What? No. Yeah, he's no. right next to you. Right? No, no. And and it was like." He, he's a Bangladesh uh, descent and he's a model. So just imagine dark skin, yeah. very chiseled, tall. And I'm just going, please make him go away. Please, <laughs> please. I said, I, I said, I can't, I can't look up anymore. My eyes are hurting. It was Pepe Le Pew with the little birds. <laughs> I was like, make, <laughs> him, <laughs> like, make <laughs> him go away. Make him go away. And then, and then as we're inching closer to Casey, the, the producer, Happened to be inching closer to Billy, Billy Zane. Zane, and I'm going. I'm texting my and friend you're a Eric. Big, big right. fan of Billy Zane. Well, I I knew this was for my friend Eric. I said, and his wife, and so I said, oh, my friend Eric, right now he's going to die. So I send him a message, and I go, just tell your wife that right at this very moment, I'm standing next <laughs> to Billy Zane, <laughs> and everyone's like, do you want to get a picture with him? And and I tried to get this guy to read my eye balls remember last last program we went into guys don't know how to read eyeballs and and i was just like trying to tell him with my eyeballs just make it happen without asking me just do it <laughs> without as making, opposed to the other guy who, who don't don't make yeah, me do it I don't make me stand yeah. next to him although i i did i did do a little like i held the, the my phone up a little bit and he i was taking pictures of all the posters and then he and his crew of people went to stand next to the posters. They kept going back to stand next to the posters. I'm like, will they just leave already? <laughs> so I don't have to keep looking away. <laughs> yeah. But but anyway, so uh, we oh, we bounced back up to 11. So I want to uh -oh. say thank you to each and every one of you. And um, 
<laughs> Somebody says they get lost in my eyeballs. That's you're silly. Anyway, thank you, Eric. There for, they are. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, wife is still a little jealous of me meeting Billy. I didn't really get to meet him. I just was standing right next to him. Breathing the same. Air. Right. And I was like, yep, that's the voice from Titanic. That, that's <laughs> him, you know, with the eyebrow and all that kind of stuff. So thank you to Neil for, uh, for inspiring this whole conversation. If it wasn't for, well, if it wasn't for you getting that job, going to New Mexico, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right, right now. And um, yeah, and it, it counts. Oh, he says it counts. And uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, that's it. And thank that's you, it. thank you to uh, to those of you who tuned into Mixler. Um, and I guess that's let's see. Oh, oh shit! Here we go again. I'm gonna tune. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Hold on to your hats, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna Mixler. Mixler audiences, they're tuning out. And uh, YouTube, hold on, just one second. Where's my? Where's the thing? Why does this always happen? The thing, the thing, the thing, the thing, the thing, the, thing. the, thing. the Bluetooth, the, the thing, thing for the Bluetooth. <laughs> it is. Well, I don't know. Okay. Well, oh, ah, right here it is. is okay. The thing. the thing. And, uh, right, nope. Yep. Oh, yep. Ah, yep. 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 Here we go. And let's see, just a moment. Let's see if we can get an ending to go on time. Oh, well, we're almost there. And, uh, oh, wait, I forgot. I should turn this off. Wait, nope. That's still going. Okay. That's done. Stop. Stop. <laughs> no, I want to sure if I want to stop the broadcast. Yep, I'm sure I want to stop the broadcast. Okay. Now we're going to do, oh, wait, nope, not that. Hold on. <laughs> and uh, almost there. And nope, nope, it's not. Oh, wait. And. And nope. What's happening here? Nope. It's really loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nope, nothing's happening here. Dun, 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 dun. Nothing's happening here. Why is nothing happening? Oh, ah, well, oh wait. Do we do? Start it again. Ah, got it. Hey there, LA. You're listening to Melissa Hill. All right, end stream. <laughs> End. <laughs>